If you built a river in a classroom, you could have a cloud, and you could have rain, and you could have rapids, and you could have more rapids. <laughs> And you could have a boat design studio where children could design and experiment with boats and they could have passengers on their boats and they could send their boats up and down the river. And if you had a river, if you built a river in a classroom, you could plan out what you're going to build along the river by each child getting a chunk of real estate and, and doing drawings at a half scale before they build. And you could grow plants in your, in your territory or your plot. You could grow grass in your plot and you could watch it grow every day. In fact, the grass we use in the morning is significantly um, taller in the afternoon. And so each child could have this territory next to the water, which would give them the security of building what they want to build or collaborating with their neighbors. And you could populate your plot with creatures and characters that you would invent by writing stories in your river journals. And you could cut up tiny figures and recombine them with animals and put wings on them that are made from milk bottles and paint them silver just for the heck of it. And if you built a river in a classroom, you could build bridges, not as an academic engineering exercise, but bridges, not, not bridges that go from nowhere to nowhere, but bridges that go from, that link different lands and different realms. Bridges that have mythic or narrative meaning. And your classroom would become, uh, um, your classroom would be driven by tiny feats of engineering. If you built a river in a classroom, you could have all kinds of different materials available and different tools. And you could have a lumber yard full of miniature lumber appropriated from the coffee and culinary industries. <laughs> and you could have special materials available that are like recycled bits that, that are special and that are maybe not in quantities big enough to give to everybody that you get from all different sources. And those could exist in the store. And the store could be run by children and they would set the hours and they would price things and they would sell these objects that the kids could use to enhance their architecture. And if you had 75 gallons of water surging around inside the classroom, you would, you would have a constant kin kinetic prompt for play, but you might also have something else which we don't usually think of having in a classroom, and that's just the edge of danger. There's a flood, somebody yells. The water is overflowing, somebody yells, and four kids come running to the scene with mops. And they have jobs, so they know that they're on the job, on the mop duty that day. And if you built a river in a classroom, you might think that you're teaching carpentry and design, but then you would find that you're also teaching civics. Because working along this 35-foot uh, object requires negotiation for people to figure out how they're going to blend their architecture and their work together.
In one instance, there were three girls who got plots along the river that were spaced far apart along the river, along the 35 feet of the river, in a, in a river otherwise completely occupied by boys. And kind of overwhelmed by the boy energy and feeling isolated from each other, the three girls decided to build a skyline down the entire length of the river using string and little cups. And in order to do so, they would have to go over the airspace controlled by the boys. <laughs> so that was kind of a cool thing, kind of a cool idea, because it was showing that they, that they were empowering themselves. But to make it work, they had to devise beautiful towers to hold up the skyline. Um, and that kind of gave them credibility in the context of the whole group when they, they, they labored over these towers and they built them and they had to plant them not only in their own plots, but they had to get variances from other kids to put them in other people's plots. <laughs> Civics. So some kids like to go really big and other kids like to, like to zero in on small details like interior architecture and furniture. This, uh, these are buttons, and these um, handles on the refrigerator are three-quarter inch nails, they're about this long, um, and uh, these burners are made from wire, and this, this was made by a 10-year-old girl who I used to call Edward Scissors Hands because she would just go away and go like this, and then this kind of stuff would emerge. <laughs> <laughs> and this boy who got in this groove of making fruit for his treehouse, and he, he got in this zone making fruit, and um, you've got to understand the scale of this. These, whoops, these, um, this is about a half an inch. These bowls are actually those metal things on the bottom of chairs. They were, they were a surplus product that, that he turned into bowls. Look at, these are his fingerprints, these, these grooves here. Look at these peppers back here. So in a sense, in a conventional sense, um, he hadn't really accomplished anything because we hadn't assigned fruit making. Um, uh, and look at this incredible composition by two eight-year-old girls who worked together and I, I, this was in the water, and I thought it was beautiful and amazing, and, I, until, and then I, I didn't really understand what it was until they explained to me that the center square is a waiting room, and it's a sea animal hospital, and each of the, each of the rectangles is an exam room where the animals are being treated. <laughs> so this was an ephemeral work. The creek near my childhood home was my first classroom. What did I learn there? I learned currents, currents, eddies, buoyancy, inertia, gravity, insects, birds, trees. When my friend came to visit, we would walk down the river and we'd, we would go down a couple of bends farther each time. You know, we would we'd get our nerve up and we'd go a little farther down the river and we really thought we were going to find a foreign country around the next bend. Um, so we were searching for a secret sea, I remember. We thought we would find an inland sea if we went down the creek, did I say river? The creek a little farther. Every, um, actions had consequences in the river. Um, there were places where we couldn't proceed because it was a sunken creek without jumping from rock to rock. And that always didn't work exactly the way we expected. So part of the experience was walking home in the discomfort of wet shoes. So we're building this big river in the classroom, and when things are going really well, we achieve what, what I and my co-teacher call the hum. The hum. And the hum is the sound of 20 children, each working at their own pace, and their attention is shifting from making to playing, to thinking, to making, to talking, and back to making. And my co-teacher and I sometimes just look at each other because we, we know we're in the hum. And the hum is why we do all this work. Without the hum, some people are not that productive. Many of us are just not wired to be consistently inspired and creative 
when we're, when we're isolated from the creativity of others. The powerful archetype of the visual artist alone in their studio may have limited the way we teach visual arts to children in classrooms, each with their own desk, each with their own piece of paper, each with their own set of paints and their own brush. We would hardly tolerate this in sports or music or theater, this um, isolation from each other, this dividing the world into disconnected parts. So the performing arts, music, theater, and, and, and filmmaking are models for the kind of ensemble visual arts that we're trying to achieve in the Riveropolis studio when we bring rivers to schools. The classroom of the 19th century may have provided a, a refuge for children from the crudeness and danger of the factory and the farm. But maybe the classroom of the 21st century needs to go in the other direction and embrace the actual things, wood, water, tools, nails, hammers, plants, soil, a garden of heavy things, a refuge not from the farm or the factory, but from the ever-present internet, um, social media, and entertainment. These, these virtual things are amazing and important but they are not the world. And I want today's children to know and love the world. Thank you.